one of my silly little mantras that I really like is just work hard, be brave. And so even in training, sometimes I'll say that to myself as a reminder, you know, you're not guaranteed anything. You have to put in the work and you have to have the guts to have a good performance to really see, you know, where your boundaries are, what kind of performance you can pull out. That was pro triathlete Maggie Rush, and this is the Yogi Triathlete Podcast. Hello, people. Thank you so much for tuning into the show today. I am your host. My name is Jess, and my co-host BJ and I have been traveling the country for over five months on our Ride the High Vibe tour with the intention of raising the vibe of our nation. And one of the brightest lights throughout our mission has been this podcast. Every week, we connect you guys, the listeners, the Yogi Triathlete tribe, with people who are looking, finding, and living their purpose. People who are living against the grain of society, pursuing what they love in this life, and having the courage to put inspiration into action. It is the warrior path that we speak of, and this path is not lived without challenge and moments of fear, but all we have to do is stay present, see the next logical step, and conjure the guts to take it. And this is what we see in the case of today's guest. Maggie Rush has been served up her fair share of adversity, but something, an innate strength to dust herself off, continues to shine brighter than her challenges. She has been shown time and time again that her setbacks are blessings in disguise and that in hindsight, life falls together like the most perfect and intricate puzzle. Having been an athlete since a young age, Maggie shares her what-if triathlon story with us, a time in her life when she turned away from multi-sport opportunity to feed her competitive spirit through volleyball. She eventually returned to triathlon post-college, and it was quickly confirmed that she really is good at this swim-bike-run thing. She started racing competitively as an age group athlete in 2012, finishing at the top of her field in every race. In 2013, after being hit by a car earlier in the season, she finished fourth overall at her first Ironman at Mount Tremblant and went on to race the Ironman World Championship that same year, a race that almost cost her her life. And we get into this story during our conversation today. Thankfully, Maggie recovered and continued her racing into the 2014 season, where she saw victory at Ironman Coeur d'Alene, taking the course for the overall age group win and went on to snag a second overall finish at the Norseman Extreme Triathlon that August in Norway. Known for its cold temperatures, technical course, and harrowing climb to the finish, Maggie says it was the hardest race she's ever completed. Having qualified for the Ironman World Championships at Ironman Coeur d'Alene, Maggie went back for her redemption race that October and quickly turned pro to race Ironman Arizona the following month. This girl is tough as nails, and that is something that she knows through and through. Overcoming so many speed bumps in her triathlon career, she never gets knocked off course no matter what gets thrown her way. But Maggie now, as she closes out her second season of racing at the professional level, she's looking for something deeper in her life, a counterbalance to her athletics and perfect complement to her never-give-up attitude. She is looking for more calm. When we caught up with Maggie in Asheville, North Carolina last September, she was just a few weeks into her meditation practice. We kick off our conversation talking about her practice and the effect she was already seeing in her life. We dive into her triathlon history, key races, and we get the full download of her Norseman experience. Balancing a full-time consulting job and her second full-time job as a professional triathlete, she is just another example of a no-excuses yogi triathlete. We loved spending time with Maggie, and we have been keeping in touch with her along the way, so please make sure to listen to the full outro for an update on what she's been up to. In the meantime, sit back and plug in to our conversation with Maggie Rush. Yeah, after we sold everything. Yeah. Oh my god. You never That's realize amazing. how worthless your stuff is until you try and get rid of it all. Well, I just moved, and I was like, why didn't I start the like decluttering process earlier? And now it's like, I never want to go shopping again. Like, looking like more, I don't know. It's, I've, yeah, I admire I, what you've been able to do. That's so cool. It was, well, it's a, it was a work in progress. Like, it was literally 10 years ago, I think, when we were living in Boulder, and I remember this moment, and you were like, you gotta come in here and check this out, and it was a tiny house. 
and was like the first person ever to live in a tiny house. And there was something about it, even though at that point in my life, I was still like drooling over the Pottery Barn catalog yeah. and all of that. There was something about it that really intrigued me. And mm -hmm. I think we almost decided immediately that we wanted that. And so now moving from a Honda Fit to a tiny <laughs> house, is I'm going to have to go out and buy stuff. Fill stuff. I'm going to have to get so stuff. <laughs> <laughs> That's amazing. So I was, we were actually reading your blog post that you just posted today. And you were saying that you're working on simplifying your life. I am, yes. Yeah, what's that looking like? Or how is it? Is it just like a mental thing at this point? Or are you actually physically starting to like just make more space? Um, so definitely, you know, with, with, you know, keeping things simple, taking out things that are no longer important in my life and, um, meditation is some of that. Like it's, I never thought I'd get to this point. Um, like it, it seems a little silly for me, but then I, you, I feel so much calmer when I am meditating and, um, you know, I do that before I start my work day and I work from home. And so just dealing with that, I think is really interesting because, um, you know, there are so many distractions and you don't have someone looking over your shoulder. So you really have to find that within yourself to manage my workload, working as a full time consultant, but then also training up to 20, 25 hours a week. And so finding balance, that's really helped a lot. Um, and then not with physically with things like just the move lately. I think that's what really drove me to donate clothes that I no longer wore or really think about, you know, why, why do I have X, Y and Z? And so I think it's been interesting kind of cutting back a little bit and you're actually getting more out of that. So where did you move from? Are you in the state or? So I've been in Asheville about two years, okay. um, but I literally have just moved the last, ever since I graduated from college. So I've lived in DC, I've lived in Austin, I've got to Asheville once I was able to work remotely. Um, but even within each city, I was moving every single year and I, I don't know what it was. I think I just was never happy with each city until I got to Asheville. And so like buying a house was a really big step for me because um, I'm kind of committing to something. And before I always, was always like, well, let's try out a new city. Let's try out a new apartment. And so literally 10 years of yearly moves. And now I'm finally kind of calming down and I love my city and I'm, you know, starting to create more of a home base, which is nice. So I want to talk about Asheville, but yeah. you said the meditation words. So you sucked me right in. Tell me about that. Like what, what finally brought you to sit? So it's, I actually was, a, I was actually big into yoga. Um, I haven't practiced in like three years, but I worked for Lululemon in college. Um, and so I actually, um, you know, was working part time on top of going to an Ivy League school and Lululemon paid for yoga classes. So I was taking three to four yoga classes a week. And looking back, I think that was my meditation. And so you know, I was juggling crazy course loads, like really demanding stuff, but I wasn't as stressed as I found I've started to get in my post-college life. Um, and I really think a big part of that was the yoga. And so um, this year when I kind of had a bad summer, I started thinking about, you know, what, why? And a lot of it was I was just jumping from thing to thing without really sort of wondering why I was jumping into races I shouldn't have been jumping into. And I actually had a bad crash because of that um, at an Xterra, which there's no reason I should have done an Xterra. <laughs> um, <laughs> I literally like rode a mountain bike once and then jumped in the race with like professionals, which is one of the silliest things you can ever do. And so really just being more sort of thoughtful about my day-to-day -day life and the decisions I was making I think my friend suggested meditation, my friend Mags, who actually lives here in Nashville, and that's been huge for me. Um, just like, I just use a little, it's called Calm, it's an app, and I just set a little five minute timer uh, um, and kind of process my thoughts each morning. So you do five minutes, mm -hmm. and you've been doing that every morning as best you can? Yeah, pretty much every yeah. morning for the last few weeks. For the last um, few weeks. Yeah. And so five minutes mm -hmm. that's made a difference i i think so yeah you know it does i i really do think so i mean what what it seems like you were describing is that there was no space between like the stimulus of oh here's the next terra and your response to that i'm gonna mm -hmm. sign up mm -hmm. like there was no space like it you were kind of moving from thing to thing and signing up for things and really like in this mode of reaction and mm -hmm. not much space like not much time spent in the gap absolutely to be thoughtful about what you were doing and that's i believe the biggest thing that meditation can give you and it and it can give you that just by sitting five minutes a day because mm -hmm. you're you're sitting and really doing nothing and so 
a lot of people will say like, oh, running's my meditation, cycling's mm-hmm. my meditation. But I, I believe that can be a form of mindful movement, Mm -hmm. but there's nothing that's going to prepare you to find that space between stimulus and response than just a still sitting practice. Definitely. Yeah. And I think, you know, it's, and some of it's, I don't even clear my mind. I know like meditation, that's kind of the goal. I really just think about what I'm doing. And I think, like you said, you're actually having to go deep and say, well, why am I deciding to do what I'm deciding? And um, that's kind of given me a little bit of a framework to really think about my races moving forward as opposed to kind of being all over the place. And you do some coaching too, right? Um, I don't personally oh, right okay. now. Um, I, well, I have helped, helped one athlete, but it's so funny you bring this up because this morning my friend Mags and I sat down and um, we are going to launch um, a coaching business slash team with Heath. Um, who's one of the the local cyclists and coaches around here. And he's he's super technical. And um, the reason I think Mags and I are really interested in launching this business is a lot of females are afraid to be more tech savvy. Um, and so they dis- they disregard a lot of like uh, the male athletes or male coaches. And so we kind of think there's a cool space there to be like a warm, caring female. Oh, I apologize. I should have <laughs> put good. that on, on silence. Um, That's inside now. Oops. So going back to what I was saying, you know, I think there's this really interesting opportunity for combining the warmth and cheerleading that you'll often get with a female that isn't really prevalent in a lot of the top tier male coaches. Um, and not to be, you know, gender biased, but I do think a lot of the specialists right now, as far as being data driven and looking at wind tunnel type of testing or, or more periodized training, um, you'll find with the male coaches like Heath or my coach, Brian. And I think uh, we want to kind of fit in that niche there. And that's Heath Dotson, who's mm-hmm. going to Kona. Yes. I just learned. I just stopped at Just Running um, to check those those guys out. And they oh, mentioned nice. um, they knew you and I was saying we were going to meet up. Um, but he seems like the real deal in the oh, area he's great. here. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. He's a former pro cyclist. Um, he's like a really good mentor. And then he's just, you know, he keeps training light and happy, which is really nice. So I ride with him a bunch, but he's also just a phenomenal athlete. Um, but you would never know because he doesn't really brag about himself or anything, which is cool. So what's the triathlon scene like here in Asheville? Is there a big triathlon scene? Like we were out riding and maybe we were riding in the wrong spot, mm-hmm. but we didn't see any other riders out there on Saturday. Really? Oh, that's interesting. I think we were probably riding in the wrong area. <laughs> yeah, I didn't see one rider. <laughs> yeah. Well, I think this past Saturday was interesting because it, there was a local gravel grinder um, that a lot of the top cyclists did. Um, I was signed up, but I was kind of sick, so I didn't do it. Um, but there's a great, it's really interesting. There's a smaller triathlon scene in Asheville. It's pretty small. Um, like I'm with the Asheville Tri Club and um, it's not huge and it's more just one and done type triathletes who are looking for that community. Um, but what's really interesting is there are amazing cycling, running, and swimming communities individually. And so I don't know what it is, but everyone's just more of like... Um, Specialists. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. And so um, like the Just Running group on Tuesdays, they have this killer track workout. These guys, they're all masters athletes for the most part, but they will like kick my butt on these track workouts. And then um, like really great swim groups. And then the cycling is really, really phenomenal. Like... Um, we have our Saturday bakery ride that starts a few blocks from where we are now. And um, sometimes Brent Bookwalter, I don't know if you're familiar with his name. He's a Asheville local. He also rides for BMC. Um, he just plays 16th in the Olympics. He'll just jump in and some of the UHC pro cyclists will just jump in with this group ride that's um, pretty competitive, but it's it's really a really great community. And um, I think my riding has gotten so much better because you're riding with these phenomenal athletes. And that's road biking, not mountain biking, right? Yeah, yeah. So these are all cyclists. <laughs> of course, they might they might poo poo you if you showed up on a TT bike. So <laughs> that's. But I've maybe if we <laughs> maybe if we explain that it's the only bike we own now, we had to get rid of everything because we can only put two bikes on top of our car. Yeah. So maybe we would get a pass on oh, that. Yeah. yeah. Um. So it's a, you mentioned it's a smaller community, but it's like a super tight community. Mm-hmm. Seems really cool, and you don't need a ton of numbers. No. But Asheville is definitely growing in popularity, and I mm-hmm. think you'll see. More more of um, more of the triathlon scene coming, but there isn't like a real big body of water around here for open water swimming. Or do you guys 
is there? There, there are a few. You have to go a little farther. Um, so some of the good triathlons locally, like uh, Lake Logan, Lake James, um, they're probably 45 minutes away. So those are really good bodies to swim in. Um, there is Biltmore Lake, which is right here in town. It's over in West Asheville, um, but it's a private lake. So if you do want to swim on it, our master's group does do a Sunday morning swims. Um, I should have told you guys about it in advance. That's okay. Great. That's yeah. all right. We'll be, I think we're going to be back in Asheville at some point. Yeah. It's a really cool vibe here. I like mm-hmm. it. And being both of us being yogis, there's definitely a great uh, community here for that. Mm-hmm. And um, so with your meditation and your yoga practice on hold, do you think you'll bring that back? I do it in the off season some like Asheville hot yoga um, downtown is really good and um, I've had some good experiences there. I I don't do well in the heat though so I I probably should find a better place uh, so I'm not passing out. But the one thing you know I I do want to bring up because you were mentioning how there's such a great vibe here is um, compared to like Boulder or some of the other places I've been and and trained um, it's not as competitive. So and I, I mean that in the best way possible. So there are these really top-notch athletes, pro cyclists, runners who could drop a 230 marathon. And there just isn't that competitive feel when you go out and train with them. Like everyone's more welcoming. Um, yeah, like it sounds like it's really inclusive. Mm-hmm, exactly. Which is so awesome. Yeah, it's you know, it's like you just want to um, get everybody out there and get them moving. Mm-hmm. Like for us, like the athletes that we work with, like we could care less if you're training to walk a 5k or if you're qualifying for the Olympic, you know, trials, mm-hmm. like it's, it's the same for us. You're still a worthy athlete, yeah. whatever. It's all relative to who you are. And we're going to put 110% into you no matter the level that you're competing at. And that's one thing I love about triathlon is that there's so many levels to compete. And it's the only sport where we're out there with you guys. Like we're out there with the pros on the same course, doing the same thing mm-hmm. on the same day. It's super cool. Like mm-hmm. I don't know any other sport that allows for that. And the pros are just normal people. Like you you can give them high fives and stuff <laughs> unless they're in the zone in that last like 10K. Exactly. <laughs> but for the most part, they're really cool. And I remember this Coeur d'Alene, uh one year with Michael Lovato and he was one mm-hmm. of, probably one of the coolest pros. And he was just, you know, running by, giving people high fives. And mm-hmm. this is on the, the, the back stretch and, I just remember early on in the career, like, this is so cool. Like, we're racing with the pros, and it doesn't seem that big a deal. So it definitely seems like Asheville's that kind of inclusive community. Mm -hmm. Um, We were considering this is an option to live at one point. And maybe we'll come back. Who knows? Yeah, we're be- we're just being re- we're really being called out west right now, as as I think you know. And um, so we're gonna go out there and, and see what's there for us. But everywhere we've gone so far on the tour, and we've been on the road for three months now. Wow. And um, by the time this airs, we're gonna be closer to the end of our tour. But everywhere we go, we 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 feel into it, and it's mm-hmm. like no, no, not supposed to live here. And this is the first place where I'm like oh, I feel really good. Like there's something about this place where I could see us living here. It's it's um, that you can kind of live in this mountainy, kind of feel this neighborhood, but then be downtown in a mile. Mm-hmm. I've been kind of cruising around with my cousin and going to some of the local places. And it's just, it's really, it's definitely our vibe for sure. We like it a lot. Yeah, there's so I think there's so many things. Like just the climb I did um, on Saturday, the... Switchbacks, I keep talking about it because I was just so excited. <laughs> and then the runs that ran down at UNC Asheville, oh, just nice. around their campus mm-hmm. um, and the, on the track. And then having Whole Foods really mm-hmm. close. That's <laughs> always a is, perk. It's always a perk for me. <laughs> we were in Boulder, there was like four within a six mile radius. And we've been deprived. We've lived really on been a, deprived. Yeah, we had to drive like an hour to get to our nearest oh, no. Whole Foods and everything. It just wasn't... It was the right place for us for a mm-hmm. time period, and and now we're we're li- we're letting loose. Um, but what brought you to Asheville? So you were in all these different places, mm-hmm. and were you in Austin prior to coming here? I was. At Austin was the last spot. Yeah, and that was another place that we were considering. And both of us actually had an opportunity to go out there this year. I ran the Austin Marathon, and then oh, BJ nice. went out there for a kind of a kickoff with the trigger point team that he's on. Mm-hmm. And um, both of us were like, no, not feeling it. Really? Yeah, it didn't feel like that was that was for us. That's so fascinating. What I, yeah. brought you here from there? That's really crazy that you say that because I feel like Austin and Asheville also have a kind of similar vibe. Um, obviously different different skew a little bit differently but um so i loved austin i actually really enjoyed it yeah i liked the Um, vibe there i just didn't feel like it felt to me like we'd be moving back 
we'd be moving to Denver. Like it felt mm. very like Denver, which is a I great city. Mm-hmm. But yeah, we're looking for new. And this feels this feels a little new. But anyway. That. Yeah. So um, my, my previous company was based in Austin. Um, and then I got a role with the company that said I could work remotely. So I kind of was put in the same situation as you guys where I said, let me figure out where exactly what, where I want to live and I can move there, try it out, and then decide whether it's for me. Um, so I actually have been coming to Asheville since I was six or seven. Um, so I went to a summer camp here for years, and then I was a camp counselor. I ca- taught whitewater kayaking. And then my parents actually, through me coming here in the summers with my brother, they actually built a house about an hour and a half north. Um, so in 2000. 14, um, I came and I stayed here the month of uh, June, and so I just tested it out. I was actually a little outside of Asheville, but um, the mountains really felt like home to me. I felt comforted by them, and of course, you know, it's always been a second home to me. So the moment I could move, I moved here, and I've just... I don't think I'm really looking anymore, which is really nice. Um, So there was one point I did think about Boulder. Um, I actually now work for a company based out of Boulder, and they have given me the opportunity to move there, but... I visited a few times and I love it, but I'm like, nothing beats home. And it's really nice to have finally found my home. And how did you – tell us your triathlon story. How did you get into it? Because you were a competitive volleyball player mm-hmm. uh, in college. Were you in high school as well? Or yes. have you always been an athlete? Yes. Um, so I have an older brother. And anyone who's a younger sibling knows uh, you grow up competitive. And it's always a race to see who can beat each other or – Uh, run fast enough so you don't get beaten up in my case. Um, That was my case too. Like (laughs) you got to run fast so you don't get locked in the pantry. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Um, (laughs) So it's, I actually, for the longest time, um, before I got into volleyball, I was a runner and a swimmer. And so back in sixth or seventh grade, um, this was kind of, this is my what if story. I was um, recruited by someone who was a youth triathlon coach to do USAT racing. Um, So juniors racing, I said, no, I want to be a volleyball player. Um, I should have looked at my 5'3 mom and my 5'9 dad and known that (laughs) would never be in my cards. Um, But I was a little stubborn, so I um, kind of got away from the endurance world. I played volleyball um, up until my junior year of college, and um, it was no longer fun for me. And one of my mottos is, if you're not having fun, what are you doing with your life? Um, And so I kind of keep that in my mind as I do my day-to-day training even now. But um, so I quit volleyball and I threw myself into studies, yoga with Lululemon. And then after college, it was um, more of a social thing. And I found out really quickly that I was good at it. Um, So I did my first first triathlon in 2011 and I ended up racing Kona in 2013, 2014. Um, And then I turned pro at the very end of 2014. And I've been sort of feeling it out since. Uh, this year's been rough. Last year was really good. And I'm, I'm hoping next year will also kind of continue the, the, the upswing again. So how did you, so from 2011 was your mm-hmm. first triathlon. How did you elevate yourself, you think, from that point to Kona two years mm-hmm. later? I mean, that's a pretty quick transition, pretty steep learning curve. Yeah. So it's, it's funny. Um, the very first weekend I moved to Austin, um, I feel like I've had some some weird accidents happen. I've had some bad luck, but um, some of them have actually turned out to be blessings in disguise. So I consider getting hit by a car the first weekend I moved to Austin and breaking my collarbone and breaking my bike as a blessing in disguise because um, I really couldn't do anything for two months. And sitting on your butt on the couch really made me think about my life priorities and um, do some introspection. And triathlon was what made me really happy and made me feel alive. And so from there, um, I got more serious. I I was with my former coach who really helped take me up a level. And so, um, you know, I I actually did my first Ironman six months to the day after getting hit hit by the car. Um, I I don't know. I did not qualify for my pro card there, but I did qualify for Kona. And I ended up doing Kona that fall a few few months later. Um, That was an interesting story because I had some heat stroke uh, where they're surprised I actually lived. Um, and then I went back for Kona for my redemption race the next year and uh, then kind of took it to the the next level after that. Back up to the, they were surprised you didn't (laughs) die story. What happened? What happened? I mean, it was heat stroke, (laughs) but how did it, how did it get away from you? You know, that's the question I ask myself every time I go into an Ironman, um, because I don't really know it went wrong. And some of that's because I don't remember the last three miles of the run, 
Um, and I don't know whether that's because my mind had already shut down or whether that was a retroactive thing, but, um, I, you know, you've, I don't know if you've read about the central governor and mm -hmm. how your body oh, yeah. shuts mm -hmm. down when it's supposed to shut down and you're forced to walk if you're overheating. Um, I don't really think I have that or I was able to overcome it in some way when I raced Kona that year, but I, I remember starting to feel a little woozy, like I couldn't keep my eyes open with about five miles to go. Um, but I would just wanted to get to the finish. And so I pushed really hard um, and essentially don't remember the last few miles. I came into the finish shoot and I collapsed and um, I spent about 10 minutes crawling and falling down in the finish shoot until they finally just carried me over the last few yards. Um, and when they did take my temperature, it was 108.5. And apparently um, only like 20% of people who reach 108 actually end up living. Um, so I feel very fortunate that for some reason my body was able to withstand potentially, you know, lethal, lethal levels of temperature. Um, and then I really, you know, I do struggle in hot races now, but I, I really don't have any lasting effects. So I feel truly blessed, um, because that was just a really strange incident and, and I don't really know how it, it how it happened, to be honest. <laughs> do you have, do you feel like you have fear around it? I do. Um, I definitely avoid hot races. Um, hot I, yoga. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Hot yoga is not as intense just because, you know, there's, there's a little more um, flow involved, but you can always step out. But um, so like, I know you did Cosmo last year. Yeah, we both um, did. Oh, I didn't, I didn't know you raced as well. Um, so it's I don't know. It's our wedding anniversary. Of oh, course wow. we did. That nice. That's awesome. That's amazing. That, what a great hot place race. to go. Mm -hmm. Hot race. And so um, I ended up getting the early symptoms that I had felt in Kona where I just felt like I was falling asleep while running. Um, and so I ended up pulling the plug at the halfway point. Were you there um, last year? Mm -hmm. yeah. Oh, you yeah. were there too. Oh, cool. mm -hmm. oh wow. Yeah. So. yeah, it was, um, I remember like getting on the run, seeing you on the run and, you know, BJ runs like when you're out there on the run, when the sun is still high in the sky mm -hmm. and it was hot. Yeah. Yeah, I both of us just never felt like we could even run on that course. I don't really? know if the heat was just sucking us all day, and then the wind, of course, mm -hmm. on that one side on of the that, island yeah, is yeah. pretty, pretty intense. Have you have you completed that race before? No, and that was that was kind of a test to come back and see whether I could do hot races in the future. Um, but I really just. I I neither need to totally rethink my nutrition for um, just hotter races or do something um, to focus on achieving it but i don't think you know i'm just really not a hot weather racer so in, during my uh during my visit to austin for the team trigger point um oh. camp we had chris lee oh, come cool. and uh talk to us mm -hmm. um he's one of their athletes and i'm sure you're familiar with his mm -hmm. experience in kona when he just was like body shut down mm -hmm. um and he spoke to us about how critical it is to have your nutrition plan mm -hmm. dialed in and he realized he was mixing gels and, and Gatorade together mm -hmm. versus like giving it some water giving your, your gut some break so he was really into nutrition so mm -hmm. we were reading something about your experience now you're using inside tracker sort of trying to dial in your nutrition experience mm -hmm. is this solely for racing or are you working on daily nutrition or mm -hmm. what what's what's behind it yeah, so um, I think, you know, for for my race nutrition, I, I did at Cozumel tried to do a little bit of what Chris mentioned. Um, so just no, trying not to get all of my calories through fluids, um, and they consider gel a fluid. Mm -hmm. I switched to base performance, which actually does help for nutrition, and then I do solids. So I do like cliff bars and, and things like that. So that's usually for, for fueling, but... Um, with Inside Tracker, it's more of day-to-day. -day. So I think um, where I am really strong as a triathlete is doing the hard workouts and getting through the day-to-day -day grind. But um, where I falter, and I think that's because I am juggling a lot of things in my life, is the right nutrition for recovery and eating immediately after you finish your five-hour bike ride and things like that. And so um, I'm really excited you know, to see where my deficiencies are, and I'm almost hopeful that I have a lot, so mm -hmm. I have a lot to improve on. It, it's, you know, you never think you want to be, quote, unhealthy, but um, so hopefully I should get my results soon and see how that goes, and um, trying to do a lot more meal prep or a lot more sort of uh, 
eating at home and and really making sure I get the recovery and nutrition side of things down. It's every it's so important. Mm-hmm. Like I know you know this. It's so important not only to recover from the workout but to be able to be you know, full as in fully prepared to Mm -hmm. hit it the next day. Mm -hmm. And so the other thing you had mentioned in your blog that you felt fell by the wayside was like sleep. Mm -hmm. And so it sounds like you're good at like, go, go, go. I can get the workouts done. I Mm -hmm. can, and it's more of the, um, maybe the downtime, Mm -hmm. but I think that meditation is really going to help you with that. To, to again, to go back to that gap, to getting mm-hmm. into like when you get back from a workout and you're on to the next thing, like getting in that gap of what am I doing? Like I've been here before. So you said that you had a rough year this year. Can you talk about that a little bit? And I'm assuming that that rough year has kind of led you to this point where you're like, all right, I'm ready for some help and I'm open to see what my deficiencies are exactly. so that you can be a better athlete, right? And a better human and and live a, live a really um, – full life like we we don't just want to live long we want to live really well exactly right so Mm -hmm. what happened this year that kind of brought you to that point yeah um so i i my coach jokes with me he tells me uh it's always something with you and i do think that's a product of me just rushing from thing to thing and making poor decisions at times um some of it has also just been really bad luck (laughs) so uh you know i i want to own all of my the things that happened to me, I don't want to blame it on outside circumstances, but some of it has been weird. So I actually had a great start to my season. I, I did really well at New Orleans 70.3 and I was on a roll and I took a bit of a gamble and I signed up for Ironman France. Um, and uh, that's a lot to do, particularly um, I was working while I was traveling. Um, so I, I work as a consultant, so I can have a little bit, bit of flexibility in my hours but I traveled so low. And um, so I was just stressed by the time I was starting the race. I was going into it not up to speed or where I, you know, I was disorganized. I wasn't getting enough sleep because I traveled over the Thursday before a Sunday race with jet lag, which is the worst idea ever. Um, So I I won't say I was having a great race, but I was doing okay at France. And then um, I came in and in T2 of all places to crash your bike, I was running with my bike because the um, bike handoff people were on strike. And so you had to rack your own bike. Um, Wait. <laughs> why? Yeah. Volunteers? Well, <laughs> everything was on strike in Europe when I mm. went over. So like the rail system was actually on strike. So I ended up having to rent a car and drive seven hours from Milan, which I flew into. <laughs> um, and then it was just a disaster. But yeah, they, they the- were on strike. So everyone had to rack their own bike which isn't a terrible thing, but they were very narrow transition racks. And so I was running down the, there was only one um, corridor, which you could run down. And there was a very long transition and someone ran out in front of me and cut me off and I just could not stop in time. And so I actually went head over heels over my bike and my rear cassette sliced open my foot entirely. I'll I'll have to show you my scar after this. And so I get up to start running. Of course I'm barefoot because you know, you leave your Mm -hmm. shoes on the bike and there's just blood everywhere. <laughs> and there are these medical people coming over talking to me in French. I don't know enough French. Um, and so it was just a disaster. I ended up getting uh, seven stitches in the med tent right then and there. And then, of course, my great plans to sightsee around France were kind of shot because I couldn't walk. <laughs> um, so that started off my season. Um, I had to take a month off for the stitches to heal. And then I came back. And then I was starting to get into a rhythm and I was running um, a few blocks away in, in um, I guess actually, no, that was in West Asheville. But I was, I was running and a dog came up and bit me. And so I had a big puncture wound on my rear um, that also took a while to heal. And then more recently, um, I had this crazy flu and it's I'm going into week three now. And I'm, I don't know if you can hear, I'm still a little bit recovering and So I feel like it's just been blow after blow, and uh, that's really caused me to refocus a lot of things because some of it was induced by me, or there are things where I could have done a better job managing it. So, you know, why did I get sick? Maybe I have some deficiencies, or maybe I was overtrained or trying to come back too quickly. Um, So that really led me to Inside Tracker, and then just trying to find some calm in my life, and that's where I think the meditation really helps. And um, just kind of changing how I how I pro- uh, process things a little bit. Yeah, the the universe has a great way to show you signs along the way, right? And if we're too busy to see them, 
yeah, the signs will keep coming and then they'll get louder and they'll get bigger and they'll get more life halting, mm -hmm. you know, which is, it sounds like that's kind of what happened. And it's not about like, did you do it? Did you not do it? It just, it just is, right? It just mm -hmm. is. Like you, that person was right there at the perfect time in transition and that just was what it was supposed to be. That dog, whatever, obviously didn't know you were a dog person and <laughs> it just was, you know, mm -hmm. and this, it, it that's a lot, that's a lot of stress too, like induced from these types of events. You know, being bitten by an animal is pretty traumatic. Whether we look at it that way or not, a lot is taken in through our subconscious that we don't maybe realize is going in. So, um, and I think maybe this kind of this week three and, you know, being sick, it's just, it's the universe's way of saying like, it's time, Maggie, it's time to take on like, you know, this new kind of outlook or direction, like it's just helping you along and, and a way to see it like from a, you know, a yogi standpoint would be like the welcoming of all things and mm -hmm. that there are no mistakes. It just, it's always leading you into the direction you're supposed to go, but sometimes it can be a little rough. Yeah. I will say it's so interesting you put it that way because while my athletic life was not solid, while all of this happened, I had bad races, a bad season to this point. My personal life has just really flourished. I just bought a house. I'm in this great relationship and I'm loving Asheville. And so it's really interesting to see how, yes, there's been a lot of bad things in my life, but I almost wonder if taking the focus away from triathlon has let me use 2016 as sort of like a settling down year and then really set the stage for next year. I feel really good um, now that I'm going in with these extra tools to make sure I'm starting off with a, a not a fresh slate, but more of like a a prepared slate um, so that I can have a really great season next year. I think what you're showing, we have a lot of people that, that listen to this, and I think that you're a living example and what you're showing people is that, yeah, you can have shitty years, mm -hmm. you know, where, where you've got this plan, you've got races, you know, and as – as age groupers, you know, um, or, you know, even pros, like you're, you know, you're investing a lot of money in this sport and sometimes it just all goes to crap, mm -hmm. but don't give up. You know, if it is something that sparks a light within you, if it's something that you truly love and you only know that by taking time out to really, to look at it. And the other way that you can look at it is when you're taken out, you know, if you're injured or if you're sick and you've got time to sit with yourself but to just keep going and know that like there's always time to begin again and set the momentum forward. So what do you say to people who like, let's say somebody's struggling with an injury and it's just really, they're just down in the depths and they just don't feel like they're going to get out again and want to just give up. Like, do you have anything to say to them? Because I, I know it's like, it's such a common struggle and it's so heartbreaking to see it as, as coaches and, um, you know, especially when people have such potential in athletics. Mm -hmm. Like, what do you have to say about not giving up on something that you love? You know, it's it's really interesting because as a person, I've always put a lot of pressure on myself to oh God, do oh. X, Y, yes. Z, I know et cetera. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I feel like the more you go through hard times, the more you can actually take the pressure off of yourself because, you know, I realize my parents are still going to love me even though if I'm not the pro triathlete I could be, or my coach is still thinks I'm a good athlete, even though I'm not getting him the results he probably deserves based on the training he's given me. But it's really interesting because I don't know if you've noticed, but this year, a high number of female pro triathletes have really struggled. I've seen at least two or three who've ended their year early because they're either overtrained or it's just not fun anymore, or they're really struggling with something about it. And that's why, you know, even though I've had a bad year, I'm like determined not to pull the plug. So in two weeks, I'm actually going to Augusta. I'm probably going to be last. <laughs> I like being sick, haven't had great training. It's going to be an ugly race. But just knowing that you can get takeaways from even the bad days, um, whether it's a bad day at a race or whether it's you know being bitten by a dog, I think, like you said, everything kind of adds up. And if you if you take that and bring it to the next chapter of your life, you're probably going to be a better person because of it. So having no expectations, like you may go into Augusta, maybe the next week or two you recover and you're rested and you're like, ah, I really don't care what happens. And you remove that element of stress and you mm -hmm. may have a phenomenal race. Exactly. We find with some of the athletes we coach, they get, they get caught up in the end result. And the end result is 
it's good to have that goal there that to shoot for it, but mm -hmm. detach from your performance or what actually is going to happen that day. Like you're doing all you can every day. Mm -hmm. You're working towards your goal. Now, whether you achieve that goal or not, it all depends on, on when it comes to racing. And that's why you race to see how it goes. So I love your your focus of let's just go and let's just go and see what happens. Like anything can happen. It's so funny too because probably two of my best races that I can think of, I went into thinking thinking I was going to do very poorly due to circumstances around it. So the first was the first time I qualified for Kona. I had only been training for two, three months um, when I went into Ironman Mont Blanc. And then um, the next year when I ended up winning overall amateur at Coeur d'Alene, I hadn't really been training much because my grandmother had died. And so I was doing a lot of traveling and I was not focused and I was skipping workouts. And so it's just really funny how, again, you never know what you're capable of because the body does crazy things when you least expect it. Yeah, anything is possible and just never losing hope. If it's something you love, there's a reason why you love it. Don't give up on it. So oh, sure. yeah, give tell us, us give about us. the Norseman. Like what, what made you sign up for that? Let's start with the seed. Well, going back to good things can come out of bad things. My my heat exa or my heat stroke led me to look for cold weather races. <laughs> wow, that's so, like the opposite. Exactly. Well, yeah, I mean, if you have a heat stroke and you want to balance it out, you go to Norseman. You do, for yeah. Sure. So um, I think I finished Kona the year I had a heat stroke, and the registration to um, sign up opened a few weeks later. I still didn't know whether I could ever race again, but I said that's the race I'm going to do if I am ever going to do a race again. So I signed up. I got accepted. It was the most, it was the hardest thing I've ever done, but the most amazing experience I've ever had at the same time. I'm like tearing up thinking about it because it was just, there's nothing that compares. Like even Kona is such a magical experience, but it's just nothing like what you get out in Norway. I guess go into the race yeah, itself. Yeah, yeah. go into the race it. or cry or whatever you need to do. <laughs> oh gosh, I better not cry. You can do anything on this podcast. <laughs> you wouldn't be the first person that cried, by the way. Oh, I believe it. Um, <laughs> give people that away. <laughs> We've had other crybabies. <laughs> oh gosh. So it's just, it's amazing for starters to get there. You're going through. I don't know if you've ever been to Norway, but we haven't. We had um, our friend Lizbeth Liz um, Kenyon. Kenyon. Oh, yeah. yeah, yeah. She. She did that a couple years ago, and so we just really followed her journey and, of course, her race. And, and Tim um, de Boom, when mm -hmm. he retired, he he did it. Yeah, some attention. So, no, we we've never been there, but just a little bit living vicariously through like Liz and her family, uh, it was it's quite a trek. Mm -hmm. Like even just getting there, right? Absolutely, yep. It was amazing. I went with my parents; they were my Sherpas, um, which is great because they're I think they're both sixty three, um, so they were about sixty at the time, and. Um, they're big hikers, so it was great for them, and we had this great family bonding. But I think the most magical thing is the the folks who put it on. There's just they're so dedicated to the sport of triathlon and Norseman itself, and they actually do the race a week ahead, um, so that they experience what the athletes experience. And they're, you know, all Norwegians I feel like are overly friendly too, so that just adds to it. But it's just it's a very long day, so you wake up around three, you have to board the ferry by four. Um, and the race starts at five. And so they literally, I did not know this at the time. I wish I had known. You can go inside the ferry where it's warm, but I did not realize that. So I was sitting there in my wetsuit in about 40 degree weather um, on this empty, empty uh, car ferry. And so you're all just sitting out there in the cold and they're bringing you out to nowhere. So it's not like there are buoys. You are literally just steaming out into the darkness and you cannot believe that you're even going to jump into this water where you can't see 20 feet. And so you jump into the water from this high platform. Um, I will admit it was a little anticlimactic. So everyone hypes up the jump, but um, I, it, it wasn't that that scary. Um, and then you swim kind of with the sunrise. And so it's, it's darker than most other Ironmans um, because you are starting so early. Granted, they have the longer days, but still it's super early. And then you come into transition and... Uh, what's the um, what's the water temperature? So I was lucky my year. I think it was only 53 or 54 degrees. Maybe mm -hmm. maybe a little higher. Which is colder than Coeur d'Alene that, that It was, yeah, it was yeah. much colder than Coeur d'Alene. Um, I did that the following year. Okay. And it was 
yeah. Like I, I couldn't feel my feet by the time I was done. My fingers were starting to go numb. Yeah. And they, they really do have to help you out of the water because you're walking on these rocks and you're not really sure whether you're touching ground or not because your feet are just popsicles. So that it, it wasn't as bad as I think other years have had it, but it was definitely interesting. I will say the shock when you jump in because you can't warm up really. Yeah. Um, you're just leaping into the water from the ferry. Definitely takes your breath away. So that was kind of exciting to start out like that. <laughs> That's, I like that. That's a very optimistic way to put it. It's it very wakes you up. It's very <laughs> it exciting to up. start that way. Yes. And so then you come into transition and you have to have your vest and your rear blankie. And um, it's weird. You you have can have one support crew person coming in and helping you. So all these people are like fully unclothing and changing and transition. I'm there with my dad and he's like, what do I do? What do I do? And um, I'm just, you don't have to do anything because <laughs> it was no different than a normal triathlon transition. And then you have a 90 minute climb up to the, the plateau and our year we had a terrible headwind. So you're biking into this headwind. Um, and then you go over five mountain passes and, um, the last one, Imen Fjell, I think it's how you say it is the hardest. And I mean, it was so funny because my parents thought they were at the top of it. And so they were like, oh, you only have 20 more feet. And then it's all downhill from here because you essentially have a downhill into T2. There were probably about two more miles left. And so even now to this day, I give my dad a hard time for uh, getting my hopes up prematurely. You gotta be, as a spectator, <laughs> just a word to spectators, you got to be really sure that they're actually oh, yes. almost there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because two miles can feel like 200 miles. Exactly. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Um, but it was interesting. So, you know, they don't have aid stations. And so everyone has a support crew with your number on it. And the whole time you're biking, you essentially have these cars leapfrogging the athletes and pulling over and handing out water bottles. And going back to my poor planning in general, um, I did not bring enough hydration mix at the time. And so I ran out of fuel about halfway through the seven, that seven hour bike and was getting diluted bottles from then on out. On top of, I used to make these nutrition uh, bites that were homemade. So on top of those. Um, so it was a seven hour bike and the last two hours were in the rain. And like I said, it was a, a lot of it was descending near the end. And I was so tired um, between the early wake up and just the effort. Um, I literally was nodding off on the bike. And so I was slapping my face and like singing and doing everything I could to stay awake um, because there was this moment where my head nodded um, like you were nodding off and I almost crashed my bike and so that was incredibly scary thankfully I haven't ever encountered that again but it was uh, it really shows you how you're pushed to your limits so I, I got off the bike and I come into t2 and I am waiting for my run gear that my parents were bringing because they're your support crew and they had gotten stuck behind um, some of the other cars because it actually it ends up being pretty trafficy with all of the cars along this narrow windy road and so I ended up sitting in transition for who knows how long, thinking my parents had just driven off of a cliff um, because there's very windy roads, kind of freaking out. But thankfully, they showed up and then um, started the run. And the first 13 miles are they're flat. And so it feels like any other Ironman, except that your parents are the aid stations. And so they're kind of running along. There was a moment where my dad had to give me a hanky because there are no port on the course and I had to duck into some woods. I got to know my parents very well uh, compared <laughs> to probably most people. And then um, starting about 13 miles, you go up what they call Zombie Hill. And it's essentially a series of switchbacks at a pretty impressive grade. I forget what it is, but it is near impossible to run the entire way. I don't think even the top winning male runs the entire way. It's a little run, walk type of shuffle. And then you reach a, a touch point or a, a pass where they check to make sure one, you're coherent. So they really do have medical staff there kind of gauging people. And then whether you're in the top, I believe 180. And so the top half or top 180 of the participants get to go up the mountain, Gasta Toppen, while the remaining just do um, a run to the hotel that's nearby. So the whole time I'm panicking whether um, I'm going to make the cutoff. Meanwhile, I find out I'm in third place overall for the females. Um, and I actually, I think I was pretty high up overall as well. So I shouldn't have even been worried about the white shirt. And then uh, you essentially get to this 
mountain climb that there's no way to describe it other than boulders where you're climbing hands and knees almost. (laughs) And my body was starting to shut down at the time. And so I was like falling. I tripped a bunch of times. I like, it was. And is it cold? Like, what are you wearing at this point? It is. So once you, it was actually pretty mild on the run when you're at a lower elevation. But once you go up zombie hill, it definitely dropped. I, if I do it again, I will probably rethink what I wear because I was just wearing a tri kit. And then once in in arm warmers on the run and then once i reached the base of gosta Toppen, where you get off road and you're actually hiking i just threw on gloves and a, a jacket but i would probably think that over again i would bring a hat and some other things because it was it was very cold um but you kind of balance you know do i stop and make this change and put on long tights or do i just kind of soldier up and suck it up and um, I made the soldier on decision, which probably <laughs> was not the right one because it was pretty miserable. Um, and it was very foggy our year. And the entire time you're asking the people who are coming down, how much further to the top, how much further? And they'd be like, oh, it's only five miles or five minutes. And then you'd be like, great, we're almost there. And then the next person would say, oh, it's 20 minutes to the top. And so no one had a great estimate. At this point, my dad hadn't really trained. So he was starting to fall behind and you can't leave your support crew. So we were freaking out a little bit about that. But So they're climbing up. The same, they're climbing up right with you, bouldering yes. and all of that. Mm-hmm. Yes. So that's definitely a consideration. Um, like my mom actually got a head start because she wanted to be at the finish. She didn't even make it to the top by the time we did. So she had to turn around early. Shortly before I got to the off-road section, I had passed someone for second female. And so um, I definitely felt like I was being chased. And so I never really got to enjoy the summit. I was just so exhausted at at my end, you know, I've I've never pushed myself to that limit that I never really enjoyed it. And then of course I, I also like to rag on my dad because he didn't bring any cash. And at the top they only have a cash for the food that they have at this tiny little mountain hut. And so of course it's only like soup and like you know, minimal stuff, but I just finished a 14-hour race yeah, and I didn't eat been for nice. like three hours. It would have been nice. <laughs> <laughs> because then you have to take this little like train. It, it was just amazing. I like, again, talking to you guys, I really want to go back and um, there's just nothing like it anywhere else in the world. Oh, it sounds like you learned a lot. And I think that that's what gets starts to get addictive about this sport mm-hmm. or certain races even because it's you can't really compare race to race like exactly. you know lake placid's hilly and coeur is hilly but you know you can't really say well mm-hmm. i'm gonna d- i can do better here because i did this at lake placid like mm-hmm. you so to go back to the same race and race the same course and with the knowledge that you learned from the first time i think that's where like it starts to get really addicting mm-hmm. where you like you want to go back right because we're just we're driven people that's why we do what we do um so well, how did you how did you end up finishing did you end up finishing second female yes so i was second female yeah, I, it was it was really good. I actually um, I surprised myself because it's very rare that non Norwegians place so high because it's um, we just don't have the terrain to really train for it. Though I do think now if I went back living in Asheville because I had only lived in Asheville for about a month at the time I went to Norseman, the training we have here is just so much more similar as far as very steep hilly climbs and hiking opportunities and things like that. Yeah. So I have a question. When you when you say like you pushed yourself harder than you ever have before, like in in those moments, what do you draw upon? How do you push yourself to where you've never pushed yourself before? You know, you do want to see what your body's capable of, but at some point it is more than the body. So when we talked about my heat stroke, at some point my my mind must have taken over and your body just will do what you will it to do. And so I think it's so interesting. Um figuring out where that that line is. Because there was a point in during Norseman where I said, I can't run any faster. Otherwise, I don't think I will actually be able to finish at all. And so there was a moment where I was potentially content with third. And then you get your second wind. And then I said, well, I might as well try to push a little bit more. And yes, you're kind of riding that line of, did I do too much? Am I going to have the energy to complete? And sort of figuring out that balance is always really interesting. And I think I'm sure everyone encounters that at the Ironman level too, no matter what your ability. So that's always fascinating. And do you ever battle with your mind out there? Like if your mind's like, oh, you're going like slow down, you're going too hard, you're going to like to a point where it's just, it's like spiraling. And how do you stay focused? How do you stay away from that noise? Because I, I think that's that's the difference between 
an athlete and a great athlete is, you know, it's that the untrained mind and the trained mind, the one that you can kind of get away from that noise. How do you how do you deal with that? I never really thought about this until just now, as you said that, but I will just repeat certain things over and over, which in a way kind of is meditation. Mm. So like I sometimes if I'm really struggling, I'll literally, literally start at 100 and count backwards from 100 which sounds so ridiculous, but that helps me with my steps. That helps to get me to the next marker. And then, you know, you can take a breather and then you start again. One of my silly little mantras that I really like is just work hard, be brave. And so even in training, sometimes I'll say that to myself as a reminder, you know, you're not guaranteed anything. You have to put in the work and you have to have the guts to have a good performance to really see, you know, where your boundaries are, what kind of performance you can pull out. So yeah, I think those those are two of the ways I kind of keep myself centered and don't get distracted about, oh, my feet hurt, you know, my stomach hurts. It kind of takes your mind off of the the physical pain of it all. And one thing that you didn't didn't actually just say right now, but but I've picked up from you is that you're also willing to go out there and just fail. Like you're going you're like you're you're going into Augusta, you don't know what's gonna happen. Like and there are some people that are like, Well, I'm not gonna sign up for an Iron Man until I know that I can place well. And mm-hmm. I remember a piece of advice that Nicole de Boom gave you so many years ago, and she said, You have to be willing to blow up. Like you have to be willing to blow up to be able to know what that what that is. Mm-hmm. Yeah, because you can't race conservative all I mean, if you really want to do well being conservative only happens for a few special talented people, I believe. I think Mm -hmm. you have to push yourself above and beyond sometimes and risk losing, which a lot of us, including me, I have have struggled with. Mm -hmm. So part of what I was gonna follow up with is when you tap into these moments, are you doing that in training too? Are there moments, because you say you you do train pretty hard. Mm -hmm. Are there moments in your training where you are tapping into that flow state or whatever you want to call it where you're just like you're in it and you're pushing absolutely um okay i i feel a lot in training i will probably say i'm not and it's i think it's a good thing and a bad thing so like i am not afraid to try to ride with the faster people and focus on nothing other than sit on the wheel of the person in front of me so i do that a lot on that really competitive group ride where I am just, my entire focus is stay with the person ahead of you. It doesn't matter if they're going to drop you and you'll have to ride 50 miles home alone. Just keep that at the top of your mind and really make sure you kind of stick with them. And so I've been dropped at this one spot on this group ride every single week, probably for the last few months. And then right before I got sick. So I was actually really excited because I was able to stick with them. I actually never got dropped the entire ride. So I'm on Strava and I had uh, my PRs on every single climb on this four hour ride, which is nearly unheard of. And I don't know what it is. I just had it that day. And, you know, the persistence of being willing to get dropped and ride with people who you probably are a notch, you know, pay grade above what I'm able to do ended up paying off because I got this boost of fitness and I could ride with them. So it really was kind of a breakthrough moment for me that I wouldn't have had if I wasn't willing to sort of put it all out on the line. I really like that. I think that that's that just speaks to so many athletes out there because, you know, some people really focus on their plans and stick to their plan. There's some people who go rogue, and they, <laughs> which I'm sure you've done yes. many times. The coach has, you know, a three hour steady ride, but you're out there hammering. Mm-hmm. But there are those moments. I don't think that can happen all the time. I think there are those moments where you do need to test yourself and, and just mm-hmm. give yourself that that confidence, I guess, that, yeah, I can do this. I am capable. I am fast. I am strong. I am brave. Mm -hmm. So you got Augusta coming up. What else do you have coming up after that? Have have we seen too far in advance or what's going on? No. So um, I'm kind of excited. I, I think I hinted at this in a recent blog post, but Of course, this all was decided before I uh, ended up getting sick, so I might not be at the level I want to be, but it will still be a good experience. I'm going into a block of a lot of racing, so I really do love to race, and I think the series of events this past summer has reminded me that when I'm not racing very frequently, I'm kind of, um, it's harder to train, I'm not as happy, and things like that, so um, I will be doing Augusta. Uh, The goal right now is to go to Cozumel 70.3 the following weekend. 
I'll have a little bit of a break. And then my friend Amanda and I are planning this epic road trip where we are, I'll drive down to Miami for Miami 70.3. And then we will drive together. She's a fellow pro, um, Amanda Windorf. We will drive from Miami to New Orleans. We'll stay with my brother for a few days. And then we will go over to Texas 70.3 where she has family. And we will race that. And um, and then after that, I will be doing uh, Ironman Arizona later in November. So Ooh, we might ooh. be there. Nice. Yeah. Will, will any of you be racing or just? Possibly. Possibly. Uh-oh. <laughs> I like that. <laughs> well, There's, like, yeah, like you. Everything is open right BJ now. BJ loves to race and, mm-hmm. and he. I haven't raced yet this year. <laughs> no. So. <laughs> so will it be based on how Louisville goes or is it just? I think so. Yeah. I'm decision? just taking it one one step at a time right nice. now I, I think louisville's the, the focus and then mm-hmm. but it, in any case if we we're down there for arizona we, we volunteered i think two years ago and nice. it was it was a really awesome race we were on the the special needs bags um on the run which was nice. quite an interesting experience oh of what people put in their bags oh i, I can't even imagine <laughs> <laughs> yeah you know like quizno subs oh. and i know and i'm like i felt like i just like a disservice like handing them like, like you here really you go. want that you know throw this up in about seven miles oh no <laughs> well in any case we'll be down there um yeah, yeah. Hopefully cheering you on which nice. would be cool yeah so that sounds like a really good adventure it seems like sounds like you know you want to race mm-hmm. um you're making a whole trip of it and, and making it fun, a fun experience and, mm-hmm. and you can do your job anywhere remotely. Sounds yes. like you can do. So it sounds like things are clicking for you. I hope so. You know, I, I'm starting to get into a good rhythm and I think, uh, this will be a nice way to hopefully get a little bit of redemption from 2016 and then, um, kind of see where it goes. The, the goal with racing in a lot of these 70.3s is the goal of, um, focusing on the shorter distance and looking at qualifying for worlds in Chattanooga. So I don't know if that's in the cards for next year, but since it's so local and since it is such a great course, um, I did the Chattanooga full last year. It's kind of hard not to at least give it a shot and maybe I'll fail. (laughs) And otherwise, you know, maybe I'll have that breakthrough. So I'm kind of excited to see how that will turn out. And Chattanooga is going to have separate starts this year. So yes. Saturday you'll be, it, it's all ladies. Yes. <laughs> and Sunday's all men. So that's kind of cool. Well, good luck with that. Oh, thank you. We're pulling for you. Our listeners are pulling for you. Yeah. And, you know, I was in yoga today. We've been, we've been going to yoga here. And I saw something on the wall. I was in Down Dog. I saw something on the wall and it said, be willing to fall apart. And I think that you've got that. And I don't think a lot of people do. And I think that's what makes you an amazing athlete. And, and just um, a strong person to navigate this crazy mess of life. So I just want to thank you so much for being here with us today. It was awesome being able to pull this together. And we will be cheering you on for sure in this tour of races that you're going on. So how can people follow you as we leave the podcast here today? How can, um, how can they follow your journey? Sure. Well, I first want to say thank you. It's been so great talking to you. And I'm, I love sharing the love of Asheville. So I'm probably Asheville's number one fan. Um, so it's <laughs> nice to see people also enjoying it. But I can be found on Twitter at, at Maggie Rue. It's R-U, like the first two letters of Rush um, for Maggie Rush. I have a blog at rushracing.com. It's a uh, R-U-S-C-H, like Rebecca Rush, uh, though we're not related. Uh, (laughs) I wish we were. She seems pretty awesome. And then I'm also on Instagram. So I share a lot of beautiful scenery photos of Asheville on my Instagram. And your puppy. Oh, yes. Lucy. Lucy. Yeah. And we'll put uh, links all to that in the show notes. And good luck with everything. And just uh, big props to getting back to full health and keep the meditation up because nothing is going to keep you healthier than that. Thank you. That's it. Our combo with pro triathlete Maggie Rush. What did you guys think? Let us know. Leave a comment. Reach out to us on social media. And please take a moment to leave a review on iTunes. We appreciate every time you guys choose to tune in and help to support the show and the guests that we bring to you. We're all here to support each other. And BJ and I couldn't feel more blessed by the honor of bringing you this show every week. Check out the show notes for ways to connect with Maggie. She is definitely an athlete to follow. So as I mentioned in the intro, I caught up with Maggie this week, and as much as I wanted to hear about her smashing courses and bringing home prize money, she was thrown yet another curveball. Shortly after racing in Augusta, she became injured while trying to ramp up for the rest of her season, and so she has had to forego her plans to race any more this year. 
But in all that is Maggie fashion, she is turning lemons into lemonade. Having healed up enough to resume her training, she was recently in Cozumel supporting her fellow pro Amanda and trying on a training full-time lifestyle. Things are clicking and Maggie and her coach are excited about her response to the higher volume. She has received her inside tracker results and is making adjustments in her nutrition to make sure that she is topped off for what's to come in 2017. And yes, she is still meditating. And it seems as though her practice has had a major impact on her life. Five minutes a day, you guys. That's all she's doing. And she is getting so much clarity on direction in her life and has made some major life discoveries since we chatted just a few months ago. And that's what it's all about. Clarity, direction on purpose, and insight into who we truly are. And yes, five minutes a day will get you that. If you have questions about meditation or mindfulness and want to learn more by working with a teacher, please reach out. This is one of the things we do as a part of our High Vibe Life offerings. The YT Tribe is literally growing every day and our 2017 triathlon and run teams are coming together strong. Stay tuned as we are getting ready to launch our new website with all our services at the end of this month. Until then, you guys keep riding the high vibe and we will catch up with you next week with another installment of the YTP.